Um, thank you, Margaret. And um, it's wonderful that we can rearrange our time and um, the generosity of our keynote speaker um, to be able to reorder his his um, time with us as well. So we are very appreciative um, of that, Graham. Thank you so much. As we um, know, awards from associations hold significance both for the receiver, but also many of those who have offered gifts along the way. In the, the supervision, the collegiality, those that find their strength to be able to support the candidates. So this morning we're going to be presenting two awards. First of all, the New Zealand Association for Research and Education Sutton Smith Award, and then the New Zealand Association for Research and Education Ray Munro Award. So I would like to invite Associate Professor Richard Smith to come forward to make the presentation for the Sutton Smith Award. Thank you, Richard. Thanks very much. Um, I'd first of all like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we stand on um, before beginning the award. As, as Julianne said, I'm Richard Smith. I work at Te Whare Wānanga o Awanui Arangi with Professor Graham Smith and our colleagues here. Um, and it's with much pleasure that I introduce the Sutton Smith Award this morning. Brian Sutton Smith um, was the first New Zealander to gain his PhD in our own country. Um, and so it's with great pleasure that we acknowledge that. I also acknowledge some of the other um, past recipients that are in the audience today and also very generously acknowledge the five-person um, committee who actually had the pleasure of examining um, the seven very, very worthy um, people who actually put forward nominations for this award. Um, however, unfortunately, even though it was very, very close, um, there can only be one winner, as they say, and it was with great pleasure that I'll be able to um, introduce Ella Kahu, who won this year's um, Sutton Smith Award, and I have the citation, the pleasure of the citation to read out before inviting Ella to come up. So Ella Kahu is at Massey University and is this year's um, recipient of the Sutton Smith for excellence in doctoral education. The title of Ella's thesis, Inviting Study In, the Engagement of Mature Age Distance Students in the Transition to University, signals the focus of her study the varied um, experiences of mature age distance students in their first year of university study. Students' experiences were explored using existing data from the Australasian Survey of Student Engagement and also an in-depth study of 19 participants, including family interviews and regular video diaries. The findings illustrated the individual and varied nature of student engagement explored the importance of space and time as key influences on students' transitions to university, and also theorised the links between academic emotions and uh, student engagement. Ella cr critiqued uh, current understandings of student engagement, developed a holistic theoretical framework for engagement, and highlighted the connections between emotion and engagement. Examiner's comments included this thesis usefully expands the current thinking on what, uh, um, sorry, on what the elements of student engagement may be. It develops a conceptual framework that takes thinking forward in general for tertiary education and more specifically for organisations catering mat to mature age distance students. Its strength lies in its evidence base built on the authentic data of the lives of the individual students. The conceptual model is the cornerstone of this thesis. This, high quality th this is a high quality thesis in every respect, and I hope that the, th the student is pleased and proud of it, as I certainly would be. Massey University has also recognised the quality of Ella's research by adding her to the Dean's List for Exceptional Theses from her year. Completed by publication, Ella's thesis includes five articles which have been published in high-ranking journals, international journals. 
One of those was a critique of the current literature on student engagement. Um, this thesis has already made a significant contribution to the field and has been cited over 50 times in a wide range of journals across a wide variety of disciplines and also countries. Comments from well-known educational ac academics speak of her contribution as perhaps the most um, useful synthesis of research into student engagement. Work from her thesis has also won Ella an international prize and a, a best paper at a conference award in 2013, Researching, Advancing and Inspiring Student Engagement, which was a conference in the, U in the UK. The contribution that Ella has made to the body of knowledge about student engagement and the impact of, of its work internationally and also locally speaks of its excellence. Ella is a very worthy recipient of the 2014 Sutton Smith Doctoral Award, so I invite Ella to come and accept this on behalf of our association. Of her thesis. Ngamahi nui a hau ki te o kairangi te awa, ko Southern Cross te waka. No ingarangi a hau. Engare Kei te whanganui a tāra a hau e noho ana, a o te roa. Ko Ella kāhu, tōku ingoa. Ko tāi kāhu, taku tānei. Ko Ngāti kāhu nunu, tōna iwi. E tū whaka i tīnei. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. For the non-Kiwis in the audience, that was an abbreviated and very Pākehā version of a traditional Māori mihi. And what happens in a mihi is you introduce yourself, but more importantly, where you're from. So what I said was my mountain and river, who I have adopted from New Zealand, and that I'm from England originally, but I now live, and my heart resides in Wellington in Aotearoa. I also introduced my husband, uh, Tai, and said his traditional tribal iwi links to the purpose of that is to show other Māori in the audience my connection to other Māori. So that's the explanation. So, on to the more important things. <laughs> okay. this, is a, this is a huge honour and a huge privilege to receive this award, and there are a couple of people that I would like to thank. As you've just heard, my research was on mature age students at university. And essentially, I'm one of those seriously egotistical doctoral students who research themselves. I was a mature age distance student. I teach mature age distance students. So I thought, what better way to spend three years of my time than researching me and other mature age distance students? And anyone who's had anything to do with a mature age student or who has been one themselves, and I suspect there are a number here, understands the importance of family in that process. I absolutely, genuinely tie and I mean this from the absolute bottom of my heart, could not have done this without you. There's just no doubt about that whatsoever, and I thank you and the kids <laughs> for that. I think the other thing that makes a real difference to a doctoral journey is the quality of supervision. And it was interesting at the two awards yesterday that that was a message that was very clear. And one's choice, luck or whatever, of getting supervisors makes a big difference to the process, and I was blessed I had Professor Chris Stevens from the School of Psychology. My PhD is technically in psychology, but it's okay. I'm an educationalist at heart. <laughs> Don't judge me, people. So I had her, and then I randomly Googled Massey's website to see if there was anyone in Massey who was doing anything with education that might align. And, and the gods were on my side because I found Nick Zepke and Linda Leach. And, you know, as, as luck goes, that pretty much caps it. They have been utterly wonderful in the last three years, four years now. I could have done it without you guys, unlike Ty, but there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that not only was the process a much richer, much better process for having you along the journey, but the end product was much better 
much richer process. Not just for your wisdom and your expertise in the field of student engagement, but more importantly, your support and your belief in me. That was something that meant an awful lot to me and still does. And I think that their belief in me is encapsulated by the nomination for this award. I mean, you know, she wrote, she, Linda wrote the nomination. She was raving about me. And I said to her before I knew that I got it, I said, I don't care if I don't get it. I just wanted to hear those wonderful words from someone I really respect and admire. So thank you to Nick and Linda for helping me in a million and one ways. Thank you to Ty. Thank you, of course, to the NZ, ARE. And I will try and keep to time and leave it at that. Tēnā koutou. My name is Bridget Percy and um, I'd just like to say, Ella, I really hope I also win that award because I also have Nick Zepke as one of my supervisors. <laughs> no pressure there, Nick. Um, it is my great honour to introduce to you the recipient of the Ray Munro Award for 2014. Hayley McGlashan from the University of Auckland is this year's recipient of the Ray Munro Award. Her thesis, Dare to be Deviant, Gay Males' Reflective Experience of Physical Education. It is a well-written and well-structured dissertation that clearly meets the high values specified by the principles that underpin the Ray Munro Award. The award specifies that the recipient has demonstrated the urge to inquire, concern for others, and the desire for self-respect. Haley's research richly demonstrates these principles. She has chosen a topic fo focused on social justice for a sp specific group of students with implications for improving teaching practices in school. Scholarly consideration of gay young men's schooling experience in general and their experiences in physical education in particular is important. Research on this specific topic is rare, either internationally or in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The thesis adds significantly to the corpus of knowledge around schooling and sexuality. Haley has examined issues for these young men in an ethical manner and provides cogent commentary on problems for them as they participate in physical education. Haley's compelling research findings provide powerful examples of how young gay men experience physical education during their schooling years and she offers recommendations for changes in practice. This aspect of her work has already had an impact on policy in the area of sexuality education in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Haley's thesis is cited in the new draft policy document, Sexuality Education, Guidelines for Principals, Boards of Trustees and Teachers. The NZARE Council and my colleagues Jenny Ritchie, Mary Liz Broadley, Ray Cialata, who were on the selection panel, has absolutely no hesitation in awarding Haley as an outstanding recipient for the 2014 Ray Munro Award.
thank you very much for those humbling words. They're very kind. Um, and thank you so much to NZARE for this generous award. Um, without this award and without the student travel grant which they've given me, I wouldn't have been able to attend this wonderful conference. Um, also, AARE, thank you very much for the, organising and hosting this great event. Um, we've learnt so much throughout our time here <laughs> <laughs> and met so many wonderful people and I do hope to come back and attend again. Um, I'd also like to thank my supervisor, my mentor and my friend, Dr Katie Fitzpatrick from the University of Auckland. Um, she supported me and guided me throughout this journey. Um, she continually challenges me and extends me in terms of my theoretical and writing skills. Um, and she's just been a rock, really, right throughout. Um, she's always supportive of Kaya and, and carries her whenever I need. And, and she's just, um, she's been amazing. So thank you very much, Katie. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge the participants in my study. Uh, without their raw, honest, eye-opening, painful memories, um, this study wouldn't have uh, come about as it did. Um, each time I sort of need to be grounded and, and think about what my passion is and, and why I'm here and why I'm doing my research, I go back and I reread their narratives um, and it just touches my heart and think about you know, these sort of things happen, happen in our schools today. Um, and we as teachers and researchers and lecturers uh, need to make uh, every effort that we can to make physical education in schools um, a welcoming and supportive and affirming place for our students. Um, I'd also like to just, on a personal note, thank my mother for travelling with me and supporting me today and throughout the week. Thank you very much. Sorry, apologies. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce um, the next keynote speaker for um, the conference. Um, but first of all, I'd just like to give you a little bit of a bio. Um, <coughs> Professor Graham Smith is an internationally renowned Māori educationalist who has been at the forefront of the alternative Māori initiatives in the education field and beyond. His academic background is within the discipline of education, social anthropology and cultural and policy studies, with recent academic work centred on developing theoretically informed transformative strategies for intervening in Māori cultural, political, social, educational and economic crisis. He is involved in the development of tribal universities and is a retired chairperson of the Te Whare Wananga o Awanui A Rangi Council. <laughs> My family has no shame. <laughs> In his former position as Pro Vice Chancellor Māori, he was responsible for developing Māori university structure within the University of Auckland. That is who, that is what um, Professor Graham Smith does. But let me tell you who he is. Professor Smith is kind, he is gentle, and he is generous. And that was very evident on Saturday at the pre workshop conference for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Māori and Pacifica, um, which was a great success. He came. Um, he wasn't registered, um, but... <laughs> <laughs> 
in the sense that that was a really lovely surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to tell Professor Smith get? No. <laughs> um, and he came and he shared, and many of the um, PhD candidates within the room were just in awe and were very grateful and very appreciative. And he has that presence wherever he goes. He's a very, very, very um, uh, wonderful man. And it is with great pleasure that I've had the honour to be able to introduce him. Please welcome Professor Graham Smith. Tuatahi, ke te haere tonu ngā mihi ki a tātou katoa i tēnei ata. Ko te tautoko hoki ngā mihi e pāna ki a uh, ngā tauira uh, uh, mō o rātou uh, mahi whakahirahira uh, i tēnei ata. A huri nō ki a tātou e ki nei ngā, kai, uh, ngā tangata whenua, ngā kaitiaki o tēnei whenua, ngā mihi uh, kia koutou katoa. Uh, Kaoro te nui aku nei mihi i tēnei wā, ingari uh, kei te, kei te uh, hari kō te ngākau, uh, kia tū mai nei, uh, kei wanganui i a koutou katoa. So just briefly, uh, acknowledgements and uh, to everybody, particularly our young scholars this morning, being recognised by our association. Um, I'll say more about uh, the issue of positionality and how, um, how I uh, uh, will uh, uh, place myself in this uh, talk this morning a little bit later on, but just for the moment can I uh, just acknowledge Tracy and uh, all of the nations who are gathered here today, including the people who are the guardians of this particular place in which we gather. Uh, also, I want to acknowledge uh, colleagues from NZARE uh, and in reference to the establishment of the new uh, Aboriginal SIG, uh, being one of the foundation members some 22 years ago of the uh, Māori Caucus for NZARE. It's particularly a pleasure to be here to see the beginning of that effort and to uh, know that, in the words of some Australian singer, from small things, big things grow. <laughs> um, and so um, I, I do want to uh, acknowledge that effort and uh, ag acknowledge my colleagues. NZARE, I'm a product of NZARE. Uh, much of my work has actually been on the back of uh, colleagues and, and uh, scholars who meet uh, in our annual event and share things and uh, or who I've worked with in different contexts. And beyond that, of course, uh, acknowledging AARE and the joint effort that's going on uh, over this last week. So um, it would be uh, important for me to also acknowledge uh, uh, Jean, Dame Jean Herbison, on whom this uh, 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 invited uh, lecture is, is uh, named after. Uh, Dame Jean was an important uh, educationalist in the New Zealand context, um, a great contributor in many different sites of education. Uh, I did meet her on a couple of occasions at different events. Um, but she has since passed uh, uh, some years ago now. Uh, and, uh, but she was the uh, Chancellor uh, of the uh, University of Canterbury, contributed to teacher education, contributed in the polytechnic sector as well, uh, and uh, an all-round uh, great contributor to uh, the New Zealand education scene. So I'm happy to be here and pleased to 
uh, present this uh, contribution uh, this morning in her name. So what I would like to do, um, because I have uh, uh, a, a, quite a long sort of looking, I'll say looking presentation, uh, but um, I'll be uh, picking my way through the presentation uh, to uh, keep, uh, keep us on time and hopefully we'll get back on the timing schedule for the whole conference. So what I want to do is to uh, argue for more education research to be transforming, not just simply descriptive. Uh, then I want to report on uh, where we're up to with what has evolved as the Kopapa Māori strategy in New Zealand, which is, if you like, a self-development educational initiative uh, that has come out of Māori community context and how that has influenced a number of uh, uh, subsequent responses across education more broadly. And then I want to examine some of the key critical elements that have been important to this particular development. And I want to do that in order to share uh, more broadly, outside of the New Zealand context, if you like, uh, the issues that, uh, that create tension, if you like, that, that, that we need to uh, find our way through as we make the space for the success of this, of this program. And finally, I want to give some examples of what I call transforming research, not just a research project and its outcomes, but uh, different elements that relate to all aspects of research, whether it's the creation of a critical mass of uh, researchers to different initiatives that uh, gather around that whole concept of uh, the transforming element around uh, the research context. I, I can use the mouse, but I really wanted the because I want to dance. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Okay, I, I needed to just correct one thing that uh, I was um, in the program of being um, assigned to the University of Sydney. Um, and so I just need to correct that because while I'm sure it was a plot by my staff to get rid of me <laughs> and to disclaim any relationship with me, I'm actually from Te Whare Wānanga or Awanui Arangi and I'm an honorary professor at Sydney University. So, uh, as I alluded to earlier, it's important to just really make sure uh, around the idea of positionality that not just paying uh, the normal lip service to acknowledgement to country. But there are deeper things at stake here when I come here as a visitor and speak on behalf of our people, if you like, on behalf of Māori in someone else's country. So it's more than just acknowledging the territory. It's, there's a wider range of things that need to be taken into consideration as I speak. Um, not the least of which is the, the protocols around our culture, what's shared, what's not shared, our understanding of um, uh, the politics of the different context in which we uh, have entered into. So one of the things that um, I want to really point out at the beginning is that uh, I'm coming to report where we are up to in our particular struggle in the New Zealand context. Uh, I don't come here to say that this is what you should do in Australia. Uh, this is what Aboriginal people should do. This is what uh, the educational community should do. I'm simply sharing what our experience has been in our New Zealand context and where we're up to uh, for better or for worse. And to say that we haven't got all the answers, we're not coming here to say Again, look at us, uh, this is wonderful. Uh, but it's, I think that we do have some things that might travel well in respect of uh, cross 
cultural sharing opportunity. But that's really up to you. Um, I'm going to lay out what we're doing and then you can pick that up and uh, do with it uh, as you will. But I need to say this as a disclaimer at the beginning. It's that often when I'm speaking in different uh, cross-cultural contexts, uh, it, I hear that uh, some people uh, pick this up and say, look at all those wonderful things the Maoris are doing. Why can't you guys do it? In other words, they pick this up and they use it to, as an instrument, blunt instrument to hit people on the head with. And that's not the intention at all. I think the intention here is to, again, in the spirit of our associations, to take the uh, baseline of education and attempting to provide educational uh, success for all of the students that we meet, what are the best ideas that travel well, and how might we uh, share in that, um, that, that, in, that, uh, in that way. Right, so we come from a um, Whakatane in New Zealand, it has the most sunshine hours in New Zealand. Just <laughs> thought I'd throw that in. Um, so I've been, uh, as I said, uh, uh, some 40 years now in education and worked in every sector, it seems. Um, uh, I was also a colleague of, of Ray Munro, so I'm happy to, to be here again for the Ray Munro Award. Um, and I worked at the Teachers College with him. I've been in uh, classrooms, I've been in the administration of schools, I've worked in alternative uh, kōhanga and uh, kura kaupapa Māori schools, and I've worked in uh, the universe, mainstream, conventional, actually I don't like mainstream, conventional university institutions and in uh, other institutions, research institutes, etc., etc. Um, so again, uh, just rehearsing the same points, that I understand the limits and capacity of the Māori struggle, of what, of what we're uh, doing, and in particular my own um, uh, limitations as well. Uh, so we, we're talking about, and when we get to the kaupapa Māori model, a model, an answer, not the answer. And in the New Zealand context, it's fair to say that there are multiple strategies that are being developed and are, and are moving forward. This is one answer that's got some good points. It's, there's some issues related uh, that need more reflection and so on. But uh, for the most part, it has, uh, I think, gained significant uh, momentum in terms of the transforming uh, potential in the New Zealand education scene. Uh, that to be explained in a moment. Uh, there's some things that we can say that we share. We share the Captain Cook experience. For good and for bad, there's some good things about uh, that, but, we all, but uh, we're connected by the Pacific Ocean as well, and that, that brings with it some, if you like, some similarities in how we might be able to speak and share ideas. And uh, for the most part, in uh, many of our countries, the uh, indigenous communities uh, share uh, some common features in terms of educational underdevelopment. So uh, from the uh, Whareiwananga context, we're, we're used to dealing with multiple communities at different times. So. For those Australians who are here, um, we're around about 4 million people in New Zealand, approximately 15% of the population is Māori. Of that, about 20%, towards 20% uh, of Māori are in schools, so a very young population. We have a single treaty which was signed in 1840, which is currently being settled with tribes around historical grievance, which is putting certain amount of resources in different tribal hands. Um, there's around about 45 recognised tribal groups in New Zealand. And a recent study by Marriott and some out of the Victoria University context showed that uh, the uh, inequalities 
between Māori and European and between Pacific and European is for the most part increasing, not closing, except in one small area, that is participation in tertiary education and of course uh, the Wānanga sector is taking credit for that because uh, we have one Wānanga has got 24,000 students, another one with 7,500 students, and another one with 3,000 students. So it's quite almost uh, in excess of 50% of Māori in uh, the tertiary sector come from three institutions. All right, so the topic that, uh, that I want to concentrate on today is transforming research. Um, and the amb ambiguity in that title is intended, because I mean both aspects of it. Uh, transforming the outcomes of research and transforming the processes of our, how we actually do it. They're both important um, places for challenge. Uh, I want to uh, suggest that we need to balance the idea of self-development uh, with external development. There's uh, quite a bit of critique, obviously, from external development processes, particularly from Pacific scholars, who see uh, you know, the implications of structural adjustments from the World Bank, from uh, different presence from other uh, major countries as being uh, coming with strings attached. And then the same in the local context. The development from the outside is often seen as problematic in that it, uh, it has some hidden um, strings. So I want to increase the emphasis on implied, applied and practical research. In other words, uh, suggest that the enactment part is the part that's often missing from our research projects. And to move us beyond just simply uh, leaving things at the level of uh, descriptive analysis. Um, I'm, I'm suggesting that our approach uh, it needs to be a 360 intervention sort of model. Again, that our struggle in the indigenous context is not one struggle, but it's multiple struggles. And this is an important sort of concept if we're trying to talk about an inclusive way of thinking about our research as an association, as NZARE or AARE and that we're privileging everyone's research is important. There's not one answer in the issues that we're facing. Everyone has a contribution to make. And so the idea of the 360 intervention is that we need to engage with multiple sites of need, often simultaneously. It's, it's, a, it's a way of viewing uh, what we're doing. So um, the, the con uh, a problem all the time is the maintenance of the status quo and by that is the reproduction of dominant interest groups because of various uh, mechanisms. So it's a factor that we should ask that question, critical question all the time. What actually changes as a result of what we're intending here or are we simply reproducing the status quo uh, which is existing uh, inequalities? Right, so uh, it, this, it's also a time to, as part of this uh, project, we, we need to continually review what we're doing ourselves. And so there's some critical questions that, that uh, we need to ask of ourselves as, indig as indigenous researchers. Uh, you know, our complicity, you know, through the PBRF process. I don't know whether you have that in Australia as well, but it's sort of personal research profiles that are based on your individual performance uh, in the institutional environment and uh, you um, can live or die actually on your performance uh, around your PBRF. And so we need to look at those as, because sometimes that uh, focuses to become more of a privatised, uh, uh, our work to be more privatised in the sense of just about fulfilling that that uh, goal without actually uh, getting on with the business of transforming. So there's a tension there. Um, and then often a lot of our research needs to be interrogated because some of us are getting out there 
and uh, simply at the will of the institution or the behest of the institution going after projects for institutional fundraising. And really, the, again, the transforming outcome for the community is diminished. Um, and the whole notion of what I call critical illiteracy is often abroad, where we don't actually see the critical context in which we're trying to travel. So why is transforming education research important? Well, from our point of view, there ain't going to be change in our social, economic and political environment of our communities without a prior or simultaneous educational revolution. It is that important. It's inextricably linked. So our work as educators is absolutely essential to that broader vision of change. So now I want to just reflect on, the, on what we call the Kopapa Māori revolution. So it came out of a piece of research. Uh, I want to go back to 1999, I think, when I first did this. And the idea here was to that a number of alternative initiatives around language revitalization began the preschool language nest movement. And then following that, the uh, Kurakopapa Māori, the elementary school movement. Following that, secondary school movement. And then following that, uh, the tertiary education uh, um, evolution. What that was about was uh, uh, mainly Māori communities themselves engaging in some self-development in the educational space. So, um, and so uh, in the early days, what I wanted to do was to look at these movements and try and understand why so many Māori gravitated towards the alternative, why they picked this up and why they saw it as important. And, the, um, and part of my question, uh, uh, questions really came out of the sociology of education, which basically uh, you know, put pressure on uh, the critique of the system as part of that. Right, so the self-development revolution began um, and they went through all of that space. Lots of people involved, major um, uh, uptake by communities, and then the idea was to try and learn, uh, from my point of view, what was the magic, the change factor? What was attracting Māori to commit to this alternative uh, sort of way of educating? And uh, notwithstanding that there are a lot of people involved in this movement, and I've just pushed three slides, and it's hundreds of people's work have just been condensed like that. Um, and in particular, I want to acknowledge Tuki Nepe, who, who was a person who I worked closely with in Auckland, who was one of the mothers of this, of this movement. And because she's passed on, and she's a martyr, if you like, for this movement, I just want to mention her name in this space. All right, so uh, I went out, interviewed a whole lot of uh, parents, asked them, why have you committed and made this decision to send your children to an alternative education opportunity? And aggregated all the answers, came up with six key reasons. So the first reason was uh, uh, grouped as tinoranga tiratanga or self-development, more autonomy. Or, uh, parents said, we want more control, more influence over what happens to the education of my child. That was really that. That's point two, language, knowledge and culture is central. A lot of parents said, we want our kids to have our language, knowledge and culture through a schooling experience. Number three, we want our kids to learn in ways which reinforce the values that we teach them at home. So the, the pedagogies, uh, they wanted alignment with that. Uh, rebuilding the power of the extended family, Fano involvement, the assistance of, of, um, of a extended family support network in the learning situation. Um, Mediating socio and economic impediments, which I felt was the most important and significant contribution here. So what uh, people were saying to me was, 
I don't want my kid to be in the freezing works like me, or I want my child to get a good, good uh, education so she can get a good job, and things like that. But what they were saying really was that, um, you know, it, we need to find ways in which uh, the education impact is going to intervene in the socio-economic conditions of the home. Now, in the Marxist literature, everyone has understood that as the, a significant issue. There's a correlation between the socio-economic positioning of communities and educational life chances in the learning setting. But very few have been able to come up with the answer, because the answer is print more money, or find more money, find the money tree, or, or find the end of the rainbow with the pot of gold or something. But, uh, and so, um, how do you do it if you're uh, unable to do, you know, engage with the, the more money element? And in, the, in this context, the way it, the uh, socio-economic impediments aren't overthrown, but they are mediated by our ability to look to our cultural propensity for working together, for collective activity, for sharing our resources, for... Um, uh, working uh, as groups. So that, um, there's a major element there which I think is significant, which speaks back to, to some of the literature. And a shared collective vision was the final point. So having understood that, the key, the, one of the things was, well, how do we pick up those elements and then uh, and move them? If they are important elements and develop significant transforming outcomes, how do we now pick those elements up and apply them to other Māori experience to make the difference, whether it's in health, whether it's in other areas? And so this has become sort of known as the kōpapa of Māori elements, the transformative elements. And um, so when we were trying to do that, there were some things that started to present themselves around the idea of transforming. And to cut to the quick, key thing is, we also need a theory of transforming. Can't just take it for granted. And so where we, we got to in the first place, which was sort of up the wrong street, was that we perceived that transforming occurred in a very linear way. That you did this, got the thought, the thought irritated you to such an extent that you made the change a very linear, instrumental way of thinking about ch uh, change and transformation. And of course there are lots of problems with this because immediately you have a linear framework, you create a hierarchy in the way in which transforming occurs. So you start to get debates between bilingual schools versus immersion schools and, we're, and con contestation for resources if you have this sort of hierarchy of of, of uh, development. So it also suggests that you've got to start with conscientization, that it starts here. And of course, uh, that wasn't the situation once we observed it more closely. Um, what we found is that actually Māori engaged in change for sometimes they sent their kids to Kohanga Reo, the language nest, because it was the only early childhood in town. Not because they'd been conscientized about language revitalization and lots of other reasons. So we need a way in which we can capture in a more inclusive way the idea of transforming. And it's that point about an inclusive model of change which I think is significant uh, for us. So if we just simply rearrange those three elements in a in a circle with the arrows going both ways, I can now plot every Māori in New Zealand somewhere in there. Hopefully they're all going the same way and going forward. <laughs> Some are probably asleep or, or, or you know, regressing or whatever. But I want to be able to talk inclusively about our need to struggle and transform and to make change and not create the divide and rule between ourselves in the community with these linear perceptions of how change progresses. So uh, this is what we call the circular practice model. Beyond that, again, borrowing, I'm not saying this is all this thinking's coming out of ourselves, but we're also looking 
and learning from other theor uh, theoretical um, uh, insights. But one of the things that we need to think about is transforming is, is not just some trajectory that's headed upwards into the sky and the never-never. That transforming work is often being continually engaged and domesticated by dominant forces. And so uh, transforming progresses like this. It has its moments, the radical potential of it is up here, and then over time it becomes domesticated, both from internal mechanisms uh, um, and also from external uh, pressures. And so the idea that there must, in any transforming movement, the need to continually to renew uh, the struggle. One of the ways in which we renew is to make sure that there's lots of people in our, uh, um, in our uh, academic, uh, if, uh, uh, amongst our academic colleagues, who are contributing to the work, who are critiquing, who are engaging, who are testing uh, the ideas as they progress. And so, so it's been with, in the Kopapa Māori strategy. Lots of writers, lots of people uh, with commentary about you know, uh, what's working, what's not working, and so on. That's healthy. It's part of this transforming uh, cycle. So the idea here, you know, drawing on the, um, again, uh, you know, without getting too theoretical, but the, the uh, you know, the issue of the collapse of utopian vision, uh, which has been, uh, you know, an important topic amongst these uh, uh, sociologists' uh, uh, theoretical work. But in a way, uh, utopian vision uh, has been reinstigated. A utopian vision is important if we understand the idea of incremental victories. So utopian vision, of course, collapsed in the sort of 1960s. It was under severe challenge. Civil rights, you know, because people started argue, uh, uh, asking after a while, when do we get civil rights? When do we arrive? And of course, people couldn't come up with the answer. So it was perceived to be a utopian vision and it fell away. So um, how do you overcome that? And, uh, you know, working off Habermas and other scholars talked about, well, we're looking in the wrong place for the utopian vision. Uh, the, utop the, the utopian vision is to be one in the incremental victories along the way towards the utopian vision. And we need to pause and celebrate the gains that we make along the way. So the idea that utopian vision being recast as an idea that gives impetus and direction to struggle is a very important point here. I'm sorry, I, I, that was a bit of a side step there. But. Uh, the, the last thing that we've learned off this model is the idea of the multiple strategies and multiple sites simultaneously. And again, um, we we'll sort of talked about that. So we won't... So, Having said this about Kurukopapa Māori, about the schools, you know, the, the uh, different schools and the models, I want to say this, is actually that's not the real revolution that's occurred in the New Zealand context. They are outward visible signs of a much deeper transforming exercise that's occurred. And the, and the, the, big, the bigger picture is that the transforming occurred here. Two inches long change of mindset from waiting for others to do things to getting up and getting engaged and, and doing it ourselves or working with others who can help us get the change, but making movement. Um, so the more recent sort of work that I've been engaged in is uh, writing now back to uh, I guess the co-option and the domesticating sort of influence that I'm seeing out there around Kopapa Māori, where people are just name-dropping Kopapa Māori and Kopapa Māori, boom, without doing the reading, without understanding the depth of what's at stake here, and if you like, being part of the domesticating process. So um, these six tests, and I'm 
um, positionality, criticality, you know, um, under, do you understand the critical context in we're working? How do we position ourselves when we're talking about it? The structuralist, culturalist considerations, again, coming off the, the back of the, um, the challenge of the sociology of knowledge and the sociology of education, which put the uh, focus on systemic uh, impediments. But also, in the, in the contemporary context, is the challenge between uh, the intersection of cultural oppression and economic exploitation in the neoliberal uh, formation of our, of our society, the way in which that works. So we need to have both of those angles, if you like, um, covered. Practicality, the reflectiveness, uh, continue, continuing reflection and so forth. And transformability, is, which is really the question about what changes as a result of what we're doing. What time do we finish? Uh, all right. I'm ahead of myself. I could be in danger of finishing early. <laughs> so um, just on the, as an example, just talking about positionality. Uh, so positionality for me is more than a passing acquaintance with the people in the land. It's really getting into the depth of what that means. So when I was in, um, you know, I come from the whale people from Ngāti Pūrō, um, and actually I can, they're a very soft people. <laughs> um, and I can tell you a story about our tribe when they went to heaven and um, uh, St. Peter uh, was at the gates and the first group that arrived there was another tribe, I won't name them, <laughs> but Cheryl's tribe. <laughs> and they knocked on the gates and uh, St. Peter, uh, Peter came down and said, yes, and uh, Cheryl's tribe said, may we come in please, we're, we're all here. And so St. Peter said, I'll just need to make contact with he, she, he uh, she, who overrules everything. <laughs> so he whipped upstairs and, and uh, asked the question, look, we've got a bunch of people down there with Cheryl and they're coming, they want to get in. What's this? And so God said, all right, I think they've been good. They've been good people, we'll let them in. So St. Peter goes downstairs and says, opens the gates and, and they come. So they all went in. Then along comes our tribe, a little bit later on, knocked on the gates, uh, may we come in please? Uh, and the, uh, St. Peter said, look, I'm gonna have to whip upstairs and ask uh, if you're able to come in. So shot upstairs, asked the question, and, um, and uh, God said, oh, yeah, they're, they're a bit rough, that group, you know. They were, uh, <laughs> They've been cantankerous, and they're uh, you know they're always that, they've got that critical edge to them, you know. Uh, all right, we, we better let them in. We let Cheryl Stevens group in. I mean, he, <laughs> so they they uh, so St Peter went downstairs. Next minute, the phone rings up. God's phone rings, and St Peter's on the phone and says, "Oh, they've gone! They've gone!" And and God said, "What's?" The Ngāti Pro people have gone, and St. Peter said, no, the gates. <laughs> so, we don't muck around as the people, you know. And we certainly don't put up with gatekeeping. So uh, I come from, if you've seen the whale rider, that's the, my tribe where I come from, and uh, Taitanga Hoati on the east coast. And last year I went up to Alaska, to Barrow. Uh, the Inupiaq people were developing a Kopapa Inupiaq curriculum for the North Slope. All right, so this is Kopapa Māori now being translated in, and for the things, elements, in a different way in Alaska for the North Slope community. So some 400 teachers came in to be rebriefed on how that, how that worked. 
But while I was up there, uh, they caught uh, eight whales in the week that I was there. So they were allowed to catch 20 whales uh, per year under scientific supervision as part of their cultural way of life. So you can see immediately here, we, we, we perceive the whale as being our ancestor in one element and in another element it's seen as another, as in a different way. Uh, and it provides f food for the community. It provides a way of um, re-articulating their cultural values and um, customs. So, uh, for example, when they, they go out and uh, hunt for a whale, they have to do it in uh, some of the traditional dimensions. A good trip is like one whale landed and three in hospital with concussion and various other things. Um, when the whale comes offshore, they, the community who belong to that whale crew, and that's done by genealogy in families, go down and they have to pull the whale in and beach it by hand. And they do their chants, they do their prayers and so on, and then they pull it in. Once it's on the beach, they can drag it with the tractor. So a whole lot of things around a different sort of uh, way of viewing uh, that the, the whale in the, in the cultural context. So, and the reason I'm, I'm, I'm sharing that is because, again, it's about not assuming our own cultural ways of doing things over the top of other uh, communities. And of course, the same in the Pacific, each of the Pacific nations is a nation in its own right, but in our country, we tend to homogenize everyone as under the Pacifica label, but each of those uh, nations are, uh, have their own cultural nuance. And uh, the other sort of homogenizing experience is our, uh, our colonizing history. So we share with Australia, Canada, and um, the United States, um, uh, if you like, our colonization from Britain. And a number of things happened there which impacted the way in which our education is experienced over the years, including the renaming of our, uh, our cultural landscapes. All right, so uh, where I want, want to go to now is just to say that inequality still persists, despite we're doing all of these uh, strategies in New Zealand. And I have to say that, to say that you don't get the wrong idea, kaupapa Māori schooling is about two things, about language revitalization on the one hand, but it's also about challenging uh, high and disproportionate levels of educational and learning under development. So it's trying to achieve two things simultaneously. Right, so I'm just going to share some, again, a, a, a number of um, uh, things that I think are worthwhile reflecting on uh, more broadly. So we need to develop a critical literacy. So if we don't understand what's going wrong, then our answers that we come up with are going to be uh, uh, less than perfect. And so we need to understand... Uh, that there's two levels at which things uh, may be going wrong. One's an overt level that we can see, but another level is the sub submerged thing. So a good critical analysis and literacy is essential. Um, and again, the structuralist, culturalist impediments. It's not just about uh, agency and what we can do as, uh, as people. It's also about uh, how we deal with some of the big structures like the economy and other things that also impact our lives. We've got to... I think engage in both sides of that, of that, um, of those impediments, if you like, where they might be situated. So schooling uh, and education, in many places, still problematic for Indigenous scholars. Second point is that colonisation hasn't gone away. 
Right, it's simply changed form in many instances and it's taken in, uh, up in different guises. But for indigenous communities, indigenous students, some of those shapes, uh, again, uh, impact our communities disproportionately. High levels of indebtedness, particularly around education in New Zealand. It takes longer for some of our students in terms of the back, so they're paying more fees. They, um, for degrees that sometimes is just simply putting them on a conveyor belt to nowhere. What's the return? Um, you know, lots of uh, hegemony, and we're all experiencing that, not just in the cultural domain, whether it's the promise of the trickle down or the promise of magnificent change from higher education reform, which didn't get past the vote today. <laughs> Uh, you know, policy manipulated. They're all areas that we need to look at. Commodification of knowledge, again, an important one for, in the context of the knowledge society and the, and the desire to create new economies off the back of the way in which we're able to um, develop uh, new knowledges. They've got some implications for the indigenous community in the sense of uh, that intersection I spoke to before, uh, I spoke about before of the, um, you know, culture and uh, uh, cultural op oppression and economic exploitation. So to wit, the, the, the greater intensity now around uh, intellectual and cultural property rights. They're all knowledge subjects that actually come back to the consideration for us as educationalists. This is uh, one of our schools um, in the local area from where the Wānanga is. Um, so our old forms of colonisation were, you know, the schools did it to us, the states did it to us, and the churches did it to us. Um, and uh, while that may be, may be true, it's, um, you know, colonisation in that form uh, may not be as prevalent as it, as it once was it's coming at us in different ways. Uh, that document on the right there is the uh, Declaration on Cultural and Indigenous Property Rights, which was uh, developed at Te Whare Wānanga or Awanui Arangi some years ago, and is now a UN document. So uh, we need to critically understand the neoliberal uh, economic context and it's different guys, so I won't spend too much time on this because it comes up again in a minute. I thought New Zealanders might enjoy this, being reminded of this. But we're, we're uh, you know, uh, have taken up, if you like, uh, uh, the free market sort of uh, economic context almost um, too willingly, it seems. Well, not enough, um, perhaps, response from uh, across uh, academia generally, not just educationists. But sort of, you know, it creates a lot of uh, pressures for indigenous communities as we think about equity. So often now in the neoliberal framing about the level playing field, that everyone is to be treated the same. Um, as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, the prior situation where it was sort of... Um, uh, compensatory forms of equity. Democracy, again, not arguing against democracy, but can be problematic. One person, one vote, majority rule. Uh, so democratic process can sometimes be manipulated. Devolution, you know, the um, illusion of sharing power. This is a bit like the trickle-down um, promise that, uh, you know, the devolving of so-called responsibility and power to communities is, is not there. What gets devolved is responsibility, but power and control remain at the centre. And the exporting, if you like, of the responsibility from the centre to uh, communities at the margins, etc., etc. Um, so one of the uh, points is that we need to understand uh, the struggle over equity has been a major uh, point of contestation 
and you know there's three uh, 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 ways of seeing that and there's possibly Treasury probably have about 20 others because they keep picking the one that that you don't know about but uh, horizontal equity is the level playing field we must treat every in our case New Zealander exactly the same so if the ship's already tilted and we're treating everyone exactly the same then those that are already advantaged maintain the advantage those that are disadvantaged maintain the disadvantage vertical equity is about compensatory forms of equity it's the old um, uh, form where uh, where the, the state had responsibility for those groups who were less well off uh, and to intervene. And distributive equity, which is more targeted at specific topics, uh, not at people's groups. So we need to understand that. Um, again, uh, equality doesn't mean equity. Equality doesn't mean justice. So the level playing field on the left, treat everyone exactly the same. Think, uh, again, just to raise some critical questions around evidence, I know most of the evidence conferences I've been to have got this critique already operating there, but it needs to be more broadly, I think, uh, taken up as, as, um, as a critical uh, element, but uh, some of our ways of testing and um, engaging in the evidence uh, portfolios does not work for indigenous communities. There needs to be it needs to be taken seriously as uh, problematic. It's not an argument against testing. I think we're we're agreeing that there needs to be ways of testing. It's an argument that we need to look more critically at what we're doing, and I guess raising the point that some people uh, are seemingly oblivious to the fact that there might be some unintended consequences of what we're doing. Right, so one of the other strategies that we've uh, taken up is indigenous theorising. And in the early days, there was a lot of uh, resistance to the idea that indigenous communities might have theory. Um, and uh, we've considered it as a particular site of struggle, that the raison d'etre of the university, of the academy, is in fact theory. If we're not in that game, then we're really outside of the academy. That's how it was viewed. How do we enter into it? And again, it's not uh, an argument against Western theory, not an argument uh, against uh, other cultural theorists, to simply saying there's sometimes we're doing things where we need to have tools, theoretical tools, methodological tools that are available to us that fit more accurately what we're working on. Um, and they should be available there and hanging on the wall of the academy, appropriately tested and interrogated with scholarship and so on. That's, that's what that's been about, that struggle. And so uh, in the New Zealand context, I think we've got some tools now that are available to us. Kopapa Māori is one of those tools that, are, that is used in that way as a way of um, uh, developing a research approach. A major thing for us is the de development theory that's come from the outside, externally generated over the top. Um, it's often patronising, done in the interests of others. It needs to be critiqued and understood as being problematic.
theory and practice. I, I, I better tell you my favourite joke because most people have heard it now, but there'll be at least one person who hasn't, so on that basis that's good enough for me. Um, but this joke is really important to me because actually we lost the, the, the main protagonist last year. He died. He was a politician. He was my first cousin. His name was Parikura Horomia, and he was the Minister of Māori Affairs. And he used to tell this joke, and I would always be the main character when he's telling it, oh, I've got this professor cousin of mine, he's useless, you know, and then he'd tell the story. So then I'd say, oh, I've got this cousin of mine, he's a politician, God, he's useless. And I, so whoever's telling the story could, uh, could embellish the joke. Anyway, this, this joke goes like this, that, um, and actually it's an educational true story. So when, when he went to school, um, you know, the, the well-worn and traditional pedagogy for learning the times tables was that you had to come up to the front of the class, trial by ordeal in front of everybody, and perform the times table. Most of us have come through this system. Anyway, on this occasion, it was the three times table, and, and Parekura, who's very slim, and <laughs> he's, he's built like me, <laughs> uh, no neck, Anyway, comes up to the front of the class and three times table, so away he went. Three ones are three, three twos are six, three threes are her, three fours are her, <laughs> And before he could go much further, the teacher said, stop, stop. What do you think you're doing, Parekura? And as quick as a flash, he came back and said, Look, sir, I mightn't know the words, but I know the tune. <laughs> and so in this way, uh, you know, this is why I'm drawing attention here to the idea that actually we need both theory and practice in what we're doing. Um, and in particular, you know, for our indigenous communities, they're actually there is a lot of anti-academy, anti-researcher, anti-institution out there in our communities. We need ways in which we're speaking to them that they can understand that demystifies the sorts of things that we're doing in the academy. So one of those big words that they're really scared of is theory. So you get, and actually I have to say this is amongst some of our teachers in the classroom as well, who you know, posit theory as being sort of uh, against practice, almost the total opposite. And somehow we need to do work that brings those two things together. And so, you know, I normally talk, when I'm talking to our communities, that theory is simply logic, the logic, the rationale for what we're doing. And theory allows us to pick up good ideas and to move them to apply in other places. But we need different ways to demystify, if you like, that language that uh, contributes to us getting it in the neck from our communities. So uh, the idea of indigenous theorising just being another set of tools hanging on the wall of the academy. Um, we need to continue to struggle. I won't say anything more than that. But, you know, our struggle is urgent in terms of the condition of where we are at as a, as a community in New Zealand and in our different uh, indigenous communities around the world. Um, we need to find ways to be positive and proactive about what we're doing. And again, uh, the opportunity here for others to join in uh, and to work in the areas that we're nominating are urgent and require attention. But there are ways of doing that. And, um, and that's one of the things I've been at pains to point out this morning. Politics of distraction. Most teachers will understand this in this day and age where we're so tied up with doing the paperwork that we don't get on with the real business of teaching. 
for, for Māori, we're so tied up with bureaucracy and other things that we're unable to get on with the task of actually working with our communities and doing the change that's required on the, on the ground. We're continually being distracted from what's important. Uh, the politics of truth is about, again, uh, talking to ourselves as communities about mystification of knowledge, about uh, different aspects that we need to confront for ourselves um, and um, get ourselves organised as much as our uh, issues are external and about changing others. But we must also uh, line up our, our, our own selves in that um, struggle. Politics of disengagement, uh, one of the strategies in New Zealand has been actually withdrawing, uh, not playing. And actually it's amazing what happens when you do that. You can't come in here. We're, we're going to do this ourselves. Next minute someone's trying to look in the window, they're trying, you know, can we come in, knock on the door? And, which is good, you know, I'm not, I don't want to uh, completely dismiss that, but in a sense, um, it's that idea of being um, courageous to be self-determining, to get on and do things if they need to happen. And the rest of the world will catch up, hopefully. So we've had our moments in New Zealand. The one significant day was the student process, uh, protest in 1984. I was in the classroom at that time. And the kids didn't turn up. <laughs> okay, so uh, one of the things when we talk about that it's a 360 struggle is to problematise the idea of single issue intervention. Uh, our first speaker on, on uh, Monday mentioned the idea of the single bullet, uh, the, the silver bullet you know, the single uh, policy approach. And uh, I want to also suggest that there's not one way to do things. Um, and I think we also need to think about, without undermining human development theory and, and the contribution there, but often the policy that's coming at us is Im has imp implicit in it human development theory, that transforming somehow is to be matured with age through the system. All right? And so what we want to do is change that model or to, or to diversify that model to also say, actually, change can start anywhere. And so in New Zealand, we're, we're changing. We've got change going on at the tertiary institution level. We've got change going on and, uh, over here. We've got change here, change there, and change there. But the policy and the funding seems to go through from let's change now early childhood and we'll go through there. So we go year one, year two, year three, have a vote, change of government, bang, back to square one. Start again, new policy, one, two. And we're not getting the, the long-term traction and the things that need to change. So by starting everywhere, is, it's a, a different way of coming at that. So again, I, I don't want to demean uh, uh, the human development uh, uh, people, but it's co-opted. Okay, I have to stop now. So um, what I'm going to do is, I've got to flick through. You were meant to give me five minutes. Oh, okay, all right, I'm going to stop, but I'll just summarise this with a quick flick through. So what I wanted to do was to show you some examples of some what I consider to be really transforming research. So we'll leave the Whareiwananga out, but you can just get a sense of it's developed over 20 years. Uh, our, we're in the middle of the worst health uh, area. We've settled with government over a treaty claim. And we've built our own campus. We own our own buildings. We get no support for buildings from government had to build these ourselves. We have about 7,000 students. All right. Um, 
and I'll, I'll finish with just quickly going through this, but this is a research done in, in, at Massey University by Monty Souter on the Maori Battalion. Uh, produced the book and the, the thesis, the research. Um, inspired our community because it's something dear to their hearts of where their relatives are buried and so on. Um, so uh, it ended up with, a, we, well it didn't end up, but it, it in, involved uh, whole communities going overseas to see, because we know where they were, were buried, to go and uh, revisit our uh, relatives. Uh, we went to visit the, this point 209, a God-forsaken place in the middle of the Tunisian desert where Mōnangārimu won his Victoria Cross, and which was, you know, coined the phrase, the price of citizenship for Māori in New Zealand, so it's got a major. While we were visiting Crete, we went to this grove where the, and we ran into an Aboriginal family there conducting ceremony. They were conducting their ceremony for their relative. So we're not, we haven't got this on our own. Then we ran into them again at Galatos. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, you know, this wiped out a whole leadership uh, group of our people, the, the war. And more recently, the tribe on the back of this research has opened its own museum and the major celebrations. Every tribe now, is, uh, the four companies, is drawing their, uh, building their own history, uh, etc. So the point I'm making here is the huge transforming outcome of that one piece of research. And so I'm going to leave it there. And I've got lots of other stories, including the 500 Māori PhDs in five years which was an uh, outstanding effort, which we did. And I won't share any of these uh, other amazing projects. <laughs> Last thing I'll say is, you know, the things that I'm, I'm posing to, to all of us is that they might seem really enormous and difficult projects, but I'm reminded of our, you know, there's a quote amongst our people, Ngāti Pro, where the chief once said, E harataku maunga i te maunga neke neke. My mountain never moves. He's just being staunch. And this Māori woman more recently has said to me when I quoted this, how do you make a mountain move? You take a step towards it. So I now invite you all to go out there and take the first step. Thank you. I just did want to be able to give an, a, a formal thank you to Professor Graham Smith for providing the, the Herbison Lecture for the conference. 
and um, uh, note that much of what he does, uh, much of what he was able to provide in that particular lecture does travel into the situation within Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, situations within the Australian context. And um, it is a really important challenge that the research that is done in the name of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research in this country is transformative for um, our communities. Otherwise, what we have to do as a nation is live with the consequences of what we have at the current situation. So thank you again, Graham. Um, tēnā tātou katoa. Um, it's my pl privilege to um, initiate this award, our uh, award for our Māori researcher, Te Tohu Pai Tawhiti Award 2014. Um, the recipient for this award in 2014 is Dr Tangiwai Mere Appleton Kepa, also known as Mere Kepa. I'm going to ask Dr. Kepper to come and stand up here. Dr. Mary Appleton Kepper, Nga Te Whātua, Te Whakatohia, Te Whānau a Rūtaia, Nga Pohi and Ngai Tūhoi. For Dr. Mary Kepper, the kaupapa of her life and research was set before she entered university education. The kaupapa is one of commitment to transforming the oppressed lives of the indigenous Māori peoples of Aotearoa. Her humble beginning as a primary school teacher has been enriched in advance to a point that Dr Kepa has become a reference of quality to Māori researchers in education and health, particularly gerontology. Her politics, honesty, staunch values, courageous spirit, coupled with aroha make her life work and research far more exciting and much more inspiring to younger generations, upcoming researchers, new migrants to Aotearoa, New Zealand, such as people from the Pacific Islands and international researchers from Sweden, Finland, Alaska, Israel and Japan, to exemplify a few. Dr Kepper's re current research is around the population health aspects of advanced 80 plus year old ageing and in changing services to enhance future generations' knowledge of ageing successfully. As an educationalist in health, her research interest is in how ethical research is conducted in collaborative projects. Additionally, based in Tamaki Makoto, Dr Kepa has conducted years of teaching and learning together with community building in both her mother and father's tribal settlements in Takahiwai in Te Tai Tokero, and Waimana in Te Uruera. Her own doctoral research and postdoctoral fellowship with Ngā Pai o Te Maramatanga in the University of Auckland has opened up new spirits and energies to challenge outmoded and colonised ways of living in favour of rethinking wisdoms of excellence and qualities of research by recruiting people with ideas and depth. Dr Kepa has been a principal investigator with Ngā Pai o Te Maramatanga, New Zealand's Indigenous Centre of Research Excellence, hosted by the University of Auckland, and she is an experienced researcher in the areas of education, health and ageing. An example of the outstanding academic work by Mere is her research as principal investigator of the qualitative study, Bring Me Beyond Vulnerability, Elderly Care of Māori by Māori. Uh, funded by Ngā Pai o Te Maramatanga, 2004-2006, and then a named investigator of the Kaumatua Taonga Aroha Research Project located in the Department of General Practice and Primary, the University of Auckland Tamaki campus. Mere was sought by Professor Nairi Kurs to prepare the Māori cohort of Te Pua Waitanga o Ngā Tapuwai Kia Ora Tonu, Life and Living in Advanced Age a cohort study in New Zealand, LILACS New Zealand, funded by the New Zealand Health Council, Ngā Pai o Te Maramatanga and the Ministry of Health. Mera became one of the two senior academics on the world's first longitudinal study of an indigenous population 
aged 80 years plus. A feature of Dr Kipper's research practice has been to create Te Ropu Kaitiaki, a group of guardians for the provision of support to Māori participants, researchers and the wider team. Mere is a founding member of the editorial board of Altern Alternative, an inter international journal of Indigenous peoples, and the guest editor of three editions. She has also written a book, Language Matters, a richer and curious approach to teaching English that was published in 2008. She's an editor of one of the Ngā Pai o Te Maramatanga special editions. The edited volume is entitled Home, Here to Stay, will be published by Huia Publishers in December 2014. Mere works in collaboration with Pacifica academics and postgraduate students to lead the Critiquing Pacifica Education at the University Biennial Conference, first held in 2007. There have been four consecutive conferences since 2007, two journal publications, a conference proceedings, and a book of poems that will be published in November 2014. In closing, Dr Kepa has been an important member of the International Writing Retreat Team organised by Ngā Pai o Te Maramatanga. She's provided academic leadership, writing support for emerging researchers, leadership for editorial matters and collegial support on numerous occasions for the team. An important component of hers to the retreat is her contribution in enabling community researchers to participate in the retreats. She's attended all 15 retreats since 2006. Mirea is a respected academic and researcher and her contribution and service to Indigenous Māori and Pacifica peoples in education and health is acknowledged by the award to her of Te Tohu Pai Tawhiti 2014. I'm going to ask I'm going to ask a former recipient of that award, distinguished Professor Graham Smith, to come and present the award to many. I dedicate this award to Paya Smith, Graham's mother, a member of our Rōpū Kaitiaki or Lilacs. I honour the first peoples of Australia, their ancestors and their sacred sites. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Ma lōlele, pula, Talo falava kiorana. This is very hard. I want to extend my appreciation to my colleagues, Māori and Pacifica, who have shown their respect for my research and work in education through nominating and awarding me the prestigious Tōhupai o Pai Tāwhiti Ki Ora Koutou Katoa. Two important experiences underpin my research and practice. Excuse me. And these are a love of learning, encouraged by my mother, the first Māori dental nurse in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and my father, a self-employed builder of, of schools in the north of our country. And secondly, the advice passed on to me by the first lecturer to create my practicum as a student training in the primary school, as a primary school teacher. Mr. Munro's courageous and hopeful counsel was that I would be a successful teacher of the downtrodden. And so, in a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen, the preparation for my success as a researcher and teacher lies with the love of my parents for me and the wisdom and sharpness of Mr. Munro. 
and I'd like to draw on Confucius here. Confucius has said that in all things, success depends on previous preparation. And without such previous preparation, there will be failure, end of quote. And so ladies and gentlemen, I ponder and write about love, wisdom, courage, and hope in advancing research to include, not dominate, downtrodden people's collective knowledges. What I strive to make clear is that histories cannot be swept clean like a blackboard so that Māori, Tongan, Cook Islands Māori, Niue, Tokelau, Samoa, Fiji, Tuvalu, among other Pacifica peoples in Aotearoa, cannot inscribe our own insights, information and experience in producing and exchanging knowledge in education research. But this is what happens in the university. And Māori people, for instance, must deal with the discourse of empire in the partnership with non-Māori. This is our special intellectual and moral responsibility as scholars and intellectuals. Edward Said has put it this way, quote, it is incumbent upon us to complicate and or dismantle the reductive formulae and the abstract but potent kind of thought that leads the mind away from concrete human history and experience and into the realm of ideological fiction, metaphysical confrontation and collective passion. This is not to say that we cannot speak about issues of injustice and suffering but that we need to do so always within a context that is amply situated in history, culture, and socio-economic reality. Our role, Fanona, is to widen the field of discussion, not to set limits in accord with prevailing authority." End of quote. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, love, wisdom, and courage to widen the, what, the field of research and education rather than clashes of civilizations, relentless, implacable, and irremediable. It, it, this is my tohu, pai tafiti, to you all. Kia ora tata, katoa.